Hallelujah. Whoa. <laughs> Slight little adjustment getting started here. Would you, <laughs> no, no problem. Would you stand with me? Let's welcome the presence of God in this house. Father God, we come to you in the blessed name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That name which is above every name and that name and that blood that gives us boldness to come into the holy of holies this morning and know that every petition that we ask of you, we have it in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, we ask you this week for salvations. We ask you for the harvest this week. We ask you, Lord, that you have your way among us, that the Northwest, that Elma, that Grays Harbor County, that Washington State, the Northwest, the United States of America, and the world shall never be the same. For, Lord, this is a week we yield ourselves to you to go to those new levels from glory to glory and faith to faith. So, Lord, we ask you for the heathen for our inheritance. We ask you, Lord, for your miraculous anointing and glory to sit heavily upon us and to move up and down these aisles and do whatever you desire to do and to even go forth in the airwaves changing lives. Lord, we've come this morning to worship you, to magnify you, to exalt you. Our God, the only true and living God, our faithful God, Lord, you have first place in our lives and in this house. And, Lord, we have come to say that you are our everything. It's in you and through you that we live and move and have our being. Through no other source, so mighty God, come and do whatever you desire to do. These are your meetings, your people, your word, your anointing, your glory. And, Lord, help us to endeavor to just get out of your way and let you be a big God in our midst. And we give you all the praise, all the glory, all of the honor. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Let's worship the Lord. We enter your gates with thanksgiving. To your courts with a shout of praise. We enter your gates with thanksgiving. We enter your courts with a shout of praise. For oh, the Lord is good, His mercy lasts forever. His faithfulness can stand the test of time. We enter your gates with thanksgiving. We enter your courts oh, with a shout of praise. Mercy lasts forever. His faithfulness can stand the test of time. We lift our hands in the sanctuary to bless you, Lord. Oh, and praise your name. Stand. 
good to give thanks to God our maker. Oh, sing our praise to the Lord most high. You mercy lasts forever. Oh, His faithfulness, this stands the test of time. For the Lord is good, for the Lord is good. His mercy lasts forever. Oh, His faithfulness, stands the test of time. We lift our hands, we lift our hands. In the sanctuary, oh, to bless you, Lord, oh, and praise your name, oh, for you, oh, Lord, you are a shield about us, oh, you're our glory, and you lift our head, for oh, the Lord is good, his mercy lies. Forever, his faithfulness stands a test of time. Sing it now, for the Lord is good, his mercy lasts forever. His faithfulness stands a test of time. Oh, your love, your love, your love endures forever, your joy. Your joy, your joy, there's nothing better. Your peace, your peace, your peace is like a river. You reign. Oh, your love, your love, your love endures forever. Your joy, your joy, your joy, there's nothing better. Your peace, your peace, your peace is like a river. You reign. Oh, your love, your love, your love, your love endures forever. Your joy, your joy. Your joy is nothing better. Your peace, your peace, your peace is like a river. You reign for the Lord is good, for the Lord is good. His mercy lasts forever. Oh, His faithfulness, oh, stands the test of time. For the Lord is good. His mercy lasts forever. Your love, your love endures forever. Your joy, your joy, your joy, there's nothing better. Your peace, your peace, your peace is like a river. You reign. Oh, your love, your love, your love, your love, it lasts forever. Your joy, your joy, your joy, there's nothing better. Your peace, your peace, your peace is like a river. You reign. One more time, your love, your love. Forever, your joy, your joy, your joy is nothing better. Your peace, your peace, your peace is like a river. You reign. Hallelujah. If you believe that He still reigns, give Him some praise this morning. We worship you. We worship you. We magnify you this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We glorify you, Jesus. Oh, we come to worship you. Spirit and truth this morning, Father God, we lift you up. We magnify you. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, lift your hands all over this building. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord is here. The Lord, the Lord is here in this place. Hallelujah. 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 You might as well go ahead and start receiving right now. Just go ahead and start receiving what you need this morning. Go ahead and step out on the water this morning. Hallelujah. Oh, just take that step out this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, 
Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, I 
just want to shout. Oh, come on, lift your voice up this morning. Sing it again. And I sing because you are good. And I dance because you are good. And I shout because you are good. You are good to me. And I sing because you are good. And I dance because you are good. And I shout. Good, you're good to me. Oh, come on, give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. Hallelujah! 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 Oh, hallelujah! Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. We could stand here all day, sing all the songs in the book, say all the words in the human language that we know, but it still would never compare to the greatness of our God. We could still, still never describe just how great, how wonderful, how good, how magnificent he truly is this morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's beyond words. <laughs> it's beyond human comprehension. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, la mandia robosia da di andara na na makoya na di andara robosia. Oh, we thank you, Father, that this week you're just unfolding more and more of the mysteries of your word. The mysteries of you, Father God, you're going to reveal yourself in a whole new way to us this week. Oh, Father God, we open our eyes this morning. We clear our minds this morning, Father. We forget about everything that happened on the way here. It happened before we left our houses this morning, Father God. We focus in on you. We focus on the Mashiach. We focus on you this morning. Our hearts are turned towards you this morning, Father God. And we're open to receive all that you have for us this morning. Hallelujah. How many of you came expecting something this morning? You came ready to receive. Well, I guarantee you, you'll leave with what you came expecting this morning. Hola, manda di Oh, hallelujah. How many of you believe that God is holy this morning?
so holy Everything we have, we will love and adore. You are high and exalted, worthy of praise. We sing, Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Holy, holy. The Lord in our 
our midst. He is so mighty. 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 He so lovely. He is so lovely. The Lord in our midst. The Lord in our midst. He's so holy. He is so holy. One more time. The saw the Lord seated on the throne he was clothed in glory and exalted train of his robe filled the temple angels 
angels gathered round him and they cry this is what they say you and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the righteous one, the magnificent one, my Savior, my Redeemer, the one who's clothed me in his own holiness, in his own righteousness, in his own glory. Holy, 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 holy,
Holy, holy, holy, holy, holy. A revelation of your holiness this morning, Lord. A revelation that you have made us holy as you are holy. And we are to walk in that for without holiness no man shall see God. Holy, 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 holy. Holy, holy, holy. Lord, you took the coal off the altar. You touched Isaiah's lips and cleansed him. But oh, as for us, you've given us a new nature. You have made us one with you. You have put us in the kingdom, taken us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We reign and rule with you. Holy, holy, holy. Thank you, Lord, that you've even made us holy. The cherubim can't understand it. The angels can't understand it as they fly around your throne. For they know you've made us holy as well. How marvelous. How marvelous. How marvelous, Lord. <laughs> holy, holy, holy are you, God. Lord, we are so thankful that we serve and love a holy God. For that's who you are, first and foremost, holy and righteous in all of your ways. Holy, righteous, and just. A God of love and mercy and great grace. But so holy, so holy. But Lord, it's not as it was for Moses and the children of Israel when you'd say, don't, don't draw too near because you're different than me. I'm holy and you're not holy. That's what they heard. But with us, Lord, our, our minds can't even comprehend it, but with us you say, come on in. Come on in. I've made you holy by the blood of the Lamb. Come on in. Draw near to me. Be one with me. Come boldly unto me. How marvelous are your ways. How great the salvation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We have no words oh, for a thousand tongues. <laughs> and thank God we have a thousand tongues in this covenant to express our thanksgiving and our worship unto you. Lord, we stand here this day. We stand here in this church alive just because of you. You've given us this building. You've given us our callings. You've given unto us every good and perfect gift that comes down from the Father above where there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. You've given unto us every good thing. Your love and your mercy endures forever. You have come to give us life and life more abundantly. We don't have enough vocal cords. We don't have enough hands to praise you and shout unto you, Lord, that you are so good all the time. And Lord, we give this, this week to you. We give our lives to you, Lord. But we dedicate right off the top this week, this week to one purpose. We lay everything else aside, the cares of, the, of life, the cares of the day, for one purpose, to enter into your glory and to be changed in that glory, from glory to glory. Let it be a life-changing week, God, not another set of services, not just another set of we had great worship and we had some good messages and three points in a poem oh god life changing and it takes your glory for that it takes your anointing for that it takes you having your way for that and it takes us yielding to that life changing so that we may make a difference in this world in the time that you have given us for we the church are your mouthpiece your hands extended your feet and we're here to make a difference, not, not have church as usual, not having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We have come to be so filled with you that we dispel your glory, that your glory and your river drips off our hands, that it comes out of our mouth, that people see Jesus in our eyes and that they're drawn unto you. As we lift you up, all men shall be drawn unto you. So we say this week, we lift you up high, Lord, above everything. And we, we expect the harvest. And we give you all the praise and all the glory in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Isn't he good? Isn't his presence wonderful? I wouldn't trade one drop of his presence for all the gold of the world. Wouldn't trade one drop of his presence for all the accolades of man, for all of the fame. Wouldn't trade one drop of his presence for anything that people on this earth hold dear. 
for they just haven't tasted or they would know nothing else compares. And it's our job to make sure they taste. To get so full of him that we give him away and that they're drawn unto him. Amen. Well, if you want to and you can, you may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Salabacho Kreski today. First of all, we say this morning, welcome not only to Faith Life Church Northwest, but welcome to this special week that we call Northwest of Blaze. This is our fourth annual one. I can't even believe I'm saying that, but the first one in this new location, the first one in our building here, which I'm so happy to be able to host. We, we used someone else's building last year and, and uh, bless them for being able to use that. And, uh, but to have it in our own place, look what the Lord has done, look what he's done. If you haven't yet seen this building, you're welcome to take a tour uh, just because it's not, I, I realize there's a lot bigger buildings and this is only another step. It's not that we're trying to show off a building, but we had such a fight in our hands to get in this building. And every devil and every man, sometimes man that had a devil, said no. But our God said yes. And it has everything to do with our message this morning. It has everything to do with the no's in your life. If God be for you, who can be against you? So it's, it's never gotten old to me. We moved in on March 26th of this year, which uh, without going through the entire story, I've just got to say this again. Many people know this. I didn't even realize, actually, once, once God really moved on the scene, uh, a loan that we've been trying to get for months and heard no from five institutions, we had in, what, three hours after the Lord told me to make one more phone call. And not only did we have it in three hours, we closed in just days after that. It didn't even take a week. That's unheard of, too. And we were in the building by the next weekend. And when I was getting ready, when I was doing the announcements for it, and, you know, I had someone who was helping me just throw me a piece of paper with a date to say, be there this Sunday. And I looked at the date, and I said, turn off Facebook Live, because I began to cry. And she said, what's wrong? I said, March 26th, that's this coming Sunday, our first day in this building? Yeah, why? Because March 26th was the day that a pulmonary embolism hit my lungs in Tampa, Florida in 2006. And I was flown by helicopter, and they said in the helicopter, first in the ambulance, then in the helicopter, sorry, lady, you won't make it to the hospital. You're dying. Then in the hospital, they said, we don't understand why you're still alive, but you won't, you won't be alive by the end of this night, and we just believe in being honest with people. <laughs> March 26th was supposed to be my obituary day. It was supposed to be the day that people said, we don't know what happened. Evidently, the enemy had some access there and just took her life early at the age of 49. But with long life will he satisfy me and you and show us his salvation. And his healing power came on the scene. And how interesting that all those years later, on March 26th, what was supposed to be our death date, became the resurrection of this ministry and this church. Only God could have put that all together like that. So if, if somebody gives you a tour today, it's not about look at a fancy building. Again, we realize there's a lot bigger, although we're trying to do this with the spirit of excellence. It's about no matter how many people say no, no matter what hits your body, no matter what the doctors say, no matter what the bankers say, no matter what your pocketbook says, no matter how hopeless any situation is, if God be for you, who can be against you? <laughs> Hallelujah. And we're just getting started. Because last week we began a Bible school here. We will talk about that some more this week. To train people to take the nations in the harvest. We've had two days of orientation in my the fun we had in orientation on Friday night, everybody said they can't wait till it actually starts. So the Northwest shall be shaken and set ablaze with the fire of the Holy Ghost. This shall become the new Bible Belt. I am tired of Washington State and the Northwest in general, all the way down I-5 through California, being known as the pot smoking, same sex, new age, twilight vampire craze, witchcraft, liberal, most unchurched, most politically liberal. It goes on and on and on and on. 
No, 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 no. God has placed you and I here for a reason, to change that. We don't have to accept that. It's only that way because the church went to sleep. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. We're still on this earth to make a difference. So we begin Northwest Ablaze to say, wake up, Northwest. Wake up, Washington. Wake up, Oregon. Wake up, California. Wake up, Utah and Idaho. Come on. Come on. We shall be the new. And when I say Bible Belt, I, I don't even really like that term because most of the Bible Belt of the South has become the religious belt with a form of godliness denying the power thereof. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost, the Word of God, faith, miracles for today, healing for today, this Bible being true just like it ever was. I'm talking about that kind of a belt. Hallelujah. And we won't be denied. I grew up in Pentecost singing an old chorus. It didn't mean that much to me as a kid, but oh, it's come to mean something to me now. I will not be denied. I will not be denied. Till Jesus comes. And this will be done. I will not be denied. Maybe somebody else will go, okay, I've just been denied. I won't be denied. Not if this word says it. It belongs to me. It's mine. I can have it. So can you. He's no respecter of persons. So this week is a very special week about people falling in love with Jesus all over again, being restored to their first love, being set ablaze, and setting everyone else around them ablaze. Because the anointing is tangible and transmittable. We say that all the time. You want to be depressed? Hang out with depressed people. You want to be critical and in a bad mood all the time and judgmental? Hang out with those kind of people. You want to have the joy of the Holy Ghost? Hang out with those. You want to get anointed? Hang out with those. You've got to rub shoulders with people that are anointed and it gets all over you. Tangible. Yeah, I see people rubbing shoulders. <laughs> tangible. Transmittable anointing. Amen. So you're in for quite a week this week. We're going to go through a little bit of uh, a little bit of what you can expect time-wise, but there's no way I can go through what you can expect spiritually because we're expecting the unexpected. We're expecting God to show up, show off. We're expecting God to come in in ways we said, I couldn't even imagine this or describe this. So I can't, I'm sorry, you won't find it in a bulletin this morning that Sister Susie will sing at 1024. We'll have prayer requests till 1027, and then we will have three testimonies till 1032. And then, and then because we're Pentecostal, we always wait at 1032 to see if God wants to speak. Oh, we gave him a minute. Guess he didn't want to. Let's move on. No, you won't find that. That's why we don't even try with bulletins. We expect the suddenlies of God. The suddenlies of God. Hallelujah. But every morning, of course, this morning, because our regular 10... Uh, our regular Sunday morning services at 1030. And we're going through next Sunday. So next Sunday morning is still part of Northwest of Blaze at 1030. But the rest of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 10 o'clock every morning and 7 o'clock every night, including tonight and including next Sunday night. In fact, we're even going to have a Saturday evening service this week at 7 o'clock. We haven't done that in the past Northwest of Blazes, but I tell you what, we got powerhouses around here that I, I want to use everybody that we can use, that God says to use in the anointing. And so every night, Sunday through Sunday at 7 o'clock. However, Saturday morning, we will not have a morning meeting. It's the only one we won't give people a little chance to fellowship when people are in from out of town, maybe sleep for a change, maybe do their laundry after a week of revival. And so no Saturday morning service, but then again, next Sunday morning and Sunday night. I'm going to give you a little clue of the people coming in. This is a general schedule, but it's a general one. If the Holy Ghost says, change this up and have so-and-so preach tonight, or we're going to stay open to it. But uh, tonight and tomorrow morning, I believe I will be ministering. Tomorrow morning, I'm not going to tell you what it's all about, but it's a very special day. Uh, and, and you want to tell the community to be here uh, tomorrow morning. They need to be here every service. But, but uh, And then starting tomorrow evening, Pastor... Dr. Mark Spitzbergen and his wife Ann will be here from San Diego, California. They pastor the Abiding Place Church. They have for, for like 36, 37 years now. And uh, they also have a ranch in Southern Oregon where they're training indigenous pastors from third world nations how to win their country for Jesus. They bring them in at their own expense. They not only train them spiritually, they show them how to grow crops, how to raise cattle, 
how to feed their nation at the same time, which gives them many open doors in countries that no other missionary can get in. Because Pastor Mark is not only, he's a scientist. How many know a whole lot of scientists that flow in the Holy Ghost and dance all over the auditorium? I don't know too many, but he is one. Flows in the Holy Ghost almost like nobody I've ever met. And yet, a very intelligent man with degrees all over the place, not only from the United States, and he's been on the think tanks of many committees in the United States. He was on the United States Breast Cancer Research Team. And, and, um, but he has degrees from other nations and from Scotland. And, from, and uh, he can get in those nations. And he says, I tell you what, I mean, Kashmir, places nobody can get into. He says, I tell you what, I'll show you how to grow crops. I'll show you how to feed your people but I ask you for a crusade. I ask you for your orphans. I ask you for your widows. Oh, you just want our orphans and widows? We'll let you have the stadium. And then has a whole ghost stadium. All of Nepal, just a few years back, had such a powerful, great awakening when they had shut down Christianity and even coming in the doors. This is the man that we're privileged to have with us this week as the keynote speaker most of the evenings. Also, pastors Jason and Hannah Gillick will be coming in from the River Northwest in Bremerton close friends full of the holy ghost they actually were teenagers touched in my meetings in uh, silverdale washington many years ago i think pastor hannah was like 16 jason might have been 20 or 21 and uh, so touched and they decided to start dating after those meetings they went to pastor rodney's bible school at my great suggestion over and over again and uh, ended up getting married there graduated became his staff his assistant pastor now they're back they pioneered a church in Bremerton and that church has just really exploded the last couple of years and uh, to have had small seed in that they're our sister church we cooperate as much as we can between their meetings and our meetings even though that's like an hour and a half drive so they have a whole lot going on this week but they're going to try to be here as much as they can and we'll be ministering some also evangelist Jason Stonecipher and his wife Kathy will be coming in from the Vancouver area. Jason, one of my best friends in the world, and his wife, and and, uh, and full of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, also touched our meetings in Washington, ended up going to Pastor Rodney's Bible school. And uh, I tell you what, I used to say back in the day, someday when I'm a little old lady, I'll be sitting on the front row in many of your meetings saying, go for it. Go farther than I went. Preach harder, win more souls, flow in the anointing better. And I'm already looking out here in the audience of many who are doing that. It's touched in our meeting. Looking at Camille here, who even though she's from the River Northwest, and her daughter and son-in-law are the associate pastors here, they couldn't get her to go to church. And I don't even remember the exact story, if it was bribery or what, how you happened to go that night. But they had me in ministry. She got radically saved filled with the Holy Ghost, called, called of God, and is now coming here to the Bible school. I look at Dina and Bud, of course, their, their father has had much more influence than I have, but been in our meeting through the years, and now they're going to Bible school and fulfilling the call of God. I look at so many others, I can't start naming everybody one by one, but this, this is my heart. This should be any true minister's heart, to not ever be territorial or jealous, but go go a whole lot farther than I went. And I just want to have the privilege of before I meet Jesus, just sitting on in, in your meeting and going, mm, amen. That's right. Hallelujah. And so these are some of the people. And then our very own, I wasn't going to announce it, and then I decided to, our very own Vince Pinto will be ministering next Sunday morning. Another one. Wow. Wow. I'm expecting a whole lot more, but just from what I've said today, if I died and went to heaven now and said these guys are going to keep carrying it on, I'd do it all over again in a minute. Comes up from Florida, a mess, unsaved. Had a broken foot on top of it. Penniless, living in with other people. Walks into my husband's church, the Central Park Neighborhood Church. I was the evangelist that week. It could have been anybody, but I had the privilege. Gets radically saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, called to preach. Ends up marrying my husband's granddaughter, so our granddaughter now. And uh, now I look at their family. He's coming to the Bible school, already on fire with the call of God. This 
is what it's about, getting set ablaze, to set someone else ablaze. And now he is setting others ablaze. And somebody that gets set ablaze there will run out and be set ablaze. Hallelujah. That's what Northwest Ablaze is all about, not just another set of meetings. We're not going to let you leave here till you're set ablaze. We're going to lock the doors on you. <laughs> I'm tempted. You know, in old-time Pentecostal meetings, they did those things. Nowadays, you'd be in a whole lot of trouble. But I read the reports and go, I love it. They'd say, lock those doors. Nobody's leaving until they get prayed through. <laughs> Hallelujah. So this is some of the lineup. And... Um, I'm just going to tell you about a few other things. We're not going to take so much time with the announcements after today, but we want to let you know what's going on here. We have a book table out there. I, I never set up this book table anymore. When I was an evangelist on the road, we took it with us. I kind of forget now because most of it's on YouTube. But there are some things that are not yet on YouTube. Not only that, but we have people in our midst that don't use technology. I understand. I only use it because I have to and get mad at it and repent. <laughs> and... Uh, Say, Jesus, let me get my salvation back here. <laughs> and, uh, but so if, if you're one who doesn't use it, I totally understand. So we have DVDs available, and we have our book, Giving, Your Key to Breakthrough. I spent $17,000 to get that book published and to reproduce it. And we had somebody in Tulsa say it would be in every Christian bookstore. As soon as everybody heard the word giving your key to breakthrough instead of getting your key to breakthrough, people didn't seem too interested. People don't like to do things the Bible way. They want quick fixes. And so I have, through the years, just sold it on my own table or given. I've given more away than I've done anything. But this week, we're going to, we have boxes in our warehouse, and we're going we're gonna to say, normally they go for a lot more than this, $5 a piece. Three for 10, that's quite a deal. Basically, you're getting one free if you buy two. Because you need to bless other people with them. You know why? We'll, we'll have Vince testify later, and we actually filmed his testimony the other night. We're going to put it up quite a bit this week. But he's one who had nothing, and he got a hold of these principles, not only salvation, not only healing, not only being baptized in the Holy Ghost, but got a hold of giving principles. He said he now does in one week what he didn't do in an entire month. And I, for one, even if I didn't have other people's testimonies, I've said many times, you've come too late to tell me the Bible doesn't work in every area. I, too, was living in with other people and had a total car. Pastor Bill Ferguson down here knows that. Knew me back in the day. Three kids to raise by myself. Had nothing, and yet uh, had a call of God to go all over the world and didn't have enough to get down the street. Somebody else came and taught me these principles by the name of Dr. Rodney Howard Brown. And I've taken them into 41 nations now. You've come too late to tell me they aren't true. And that book has a lot of teaching and a lot of my personal testimonies that we don't have time to say in a service. So you want to get that mini DVDs where you see the glory come down. Some of them you see me dancing in the Holy Ghost. And with those DVDs, because we didn't even think about it until Brother Ellen down here suggested it the other night. You ought to put your book table out. We should have reproduced stuff and we didn't in time. But we have at least one, sometimes two or three, of everything. And if we run out of something and you want to order it, we have these order forms out here. And we will put in an order and order whatever you need, and we will ship it to you free of cost. Uh, and if you live in the area, you, you might even want to come and pick it up. So you want to go by that book table. Um, and I'm going to just tell you a few things about the meeting so you won't be surprised. First of all, how many can give Brother Jeff Edwards all the way from Florida a big Holy Ghost Faith Life Church welcome? You have already gotten a taste this morning, but oh, there's so much more to come. I really consider Jeff to be one of the most anointed and talented worship leaders in the world. And not everybody knows that yet, but they will. And I, we should be thankful not everybody else knows that, so we can still get him once in a while. And... Um, and what a joy it is to have him back with us. And, but I trust the anointing on his life. If he takes off in the Holy Ghost, if he takes off exhorting or preaching or takes off in something that he doesn't plan on in a lineup, prophesy. Anything can happen here. How many have heard that song? Anything can happen and it probably will. Here we don't just sing it. We actually believe that. Anything can happen and it probably will. Something very good. Something good is going on around here. These services aren't a little dry cleaning service. You may have already figured that out. You know what I mean by dry cleaning service? In by 10, out by 11, or money back guarantee. 
This isn't a laundromat. These services are ordained for us to soak in the glory of God. And I know America isn't used to that. Oh, they are in the foreign field. In China, they will lay in cramped cupboards for eight hours and say, don't quit yet. Starving for the anointing and the glory. Not here. We're used to Pizza Hut. If you don't deliver it in five minutes, I want money back. We're used to McDonald's. Give me my shake, my fry in five minutes. Well, we aren't here just to give you a little shake in five minutes. You look, I don't want to preach a whole message right here, but you look all through the Bible. Let's start in the New Testament. Paul's services went so long, hours and hours, that a man fell asleep and fell out and was dead, and he had to go resurrect him from the the dead so they could continue. So that's one reason we don't have a second story around here. (laughs) Yes. And you look in the Old Testament, and you see that in the dedication of Solomon's temple, I mean, all of those things, hours and hours just to, just for the sacrifice, let alone the worship. And we wonder why we don't see the things they used to see in days gone by. Well, give her 20 minutes to say it. She can't say it in 20 minutes. Had not to be said. That is religion and tradition. That is not Bible, and that's not the Holy Ghost. Now, I don't believe in delaying things and dragging them out just to say, hey, we had a four-hour service. We set a new record. No, some services you're in, we're all praying, God, let it be done in 15 minutes max. <laughs> when you're sitting under death and religion, it's going to hurry this thing up. We don't need much more of it. But it takes time to even get people, like he was talking about today, and we were seeing it takes time to get the focus, get rid of all the junk out there. And people are just ready to start focusing in when the service is over many times. We're going to let people testify. We're going we're to just follow the Holy Ghost now. If you have an appointment, if you have to leave early, I ask you two things. We, I promise you, will not get offended. However, I ask you to leave quietly. Not, hey, see you next week at the fishing pond, Jim. Leave quietly because people's lives are being forever changed. And we won't get offended, but I ask you this, to not get offended if we go on. Not walk out and go, oh, you ought to have seen those ridiculous people. I've never seen church go this long in my life. No. We're pressing in for new realms this week. We're pressing in for somebody's miracle. If it was you who needed a new heart, like I did a few years ago, and God gave me one, thank God, would you want us to hurry it up, or would you want us to press in until we got it for your disease, for your miracle? So we just ask you to not be offended if, if they go a little longer than you're used to. We are here to be changed forever. It's these kinds of services. People ask me all the time, how have you gone into the nations of the world? How did you get started? How, how, you know, you had some setbacks in life and went through some things, and how did you get back up? Easy answer. I did whatever it took to keep getting in anointed meetings. I would fly in. I'm in a four-week revival in Australia. The whole nation is ablaze. They asked me to stay. I think I could have stayed there six months. But I said, no, Pastor Rodney Howard Brown's camp meeting next week. I got to go get some more. But Debbie, you've been to like 20 of those. It won't matter if you miss one. No, the more I give out, the more I got to take some back in. If I'm going to keep having this fire, I got to be where this kind of fire is. And I would press in. Uh, they let me out of hospitals and said, no, you can't go to that meeting. And I was sometimes bandaged from a surgery and would be there anyway that night and get called on to preach and nobody knew. Stitches where you can't but that's how you keep getting more. Nowadays, people say, I could, couldn't make it to your healing service the other night. I wasn't feeling good. <laughs> I heard you had great joy, but I couldn't come. I was really feeling depressed and down. Yeah. It doesn't take much to cause some people to stay home anymore. But we're pressing in for the glory. Pastor Mark, by the way, is flying in from Finland. He's holding crusades over there right now. First time he's been to Finland straight from there as he comes in. So that gives you an idea of things going on. We may have to make some uh, from time to time as the week goes on. How many are here in this house for the first time this morning? Could I see your hand? Welcome. Welcome. Now I'm just going to tell you some of you, I've already met some. I know some are here from other churches. We're not trying to steal people from other churches. But we do want to have a record of your visit. For one thing, we will notify you when we have meetings like this, when we have special events. And we will have, and also, if you ever need something uh, for any reason, and we can be of assistance, we want you to be able to let us know. So 
Brother Gary, our usher, is in the aisle. And if you could keep those hands up, anybody visiting for the first time, we, we just, if, if you would, he's going to give you um, a visitor's form. And uh, after you fill that out, if you could either put that back in the offering uh, basket in a few minutes or see uh, Brother Gary or Charlotte over here afterwards, if you don't catch the offering bucket in time. This is Charlotte, his wife. See one of them and give them that form at the end. But please welcome. After you're here one time, you you are no longer a stranger. And uh, I, I want to say one more thing before we receive the tithe and offering this morning. We are so very privileged this morning to have Pastor Bill Ferguson with us from North Pole, Alaska. If it was winter, he would have had to get Santa Claus's permission to come because that's where the Santa Claus house is in North Pole. But <laughs> since it's fall, he didn't have to get it. No, uh, no they actually do have a, a, a Santa Claus house there. We have a lot of fun with that and taking pictures. But uh, it is a suburb of Fairbanks. Uh, Alaska, and um, Pastor Bill is honestly one of my best friends in the entire world, and now my husband, uh, since we've been married. In fact, they're both Alabama boys, both were in the Air Force, both, yeah, both airplane mechanics. They have a lot in common, and, um, but Pastor Bill, I, I said this at Pass Northwest of Blazes, but I'm going to say it again. You know, when I was getting started in Alaska, Nobody really knew who I was, and if they took a look at that wreck car, they'd just think, she's going nowhere, and knew that at that time, after being abused for 18 years, I was a single mom with, with three kids, and, and uh, I think most people looked and said, I don't know what you think you're called to do, honey, but it's not going to happen, but Pastor Bill and his wife, Bonnie, saw the call of God in my life, the touch of God in my life, and made a way and opened doors when nobody was opening doors. Now, God will make sure he uses somebody, but this is the vessel that obeyed. And um, not only that, Pastor Bill at the time, he was not a pastor at that time. He was Full Gospel Businessman Fellowship president and brought me a lady into Full Gospel Businessman. I think that surprised him, but we had a good time. And as a result, churches all over the Fairbanks area began to open up, and we held meetings in he and Bonnie's house many times. We had Holy Ghost meetings that would last till 1 or 2 in the morning in their home, better than I've had in a lot of churches because there was no religious opposition. And uh, we were so blessed. We became such good friends. I've stayed in their home so many times. And uh, Bonnie graduated on to heaven a few years ago. And this, by the way, is Dina's father, and her, her mom's in heaven today, and Bud's father-in-law here. And um, a great church, and I saw the call of God on him to pastor. It, it was kind of a reciprocal thing. I think before anyone else recognized that except for them, and I, I was hesitant because, as I told the students the other night, when it comes to personal prophecy, I'm more hesitant than about any minister I know of. But after a while, I knew the Lord was all over me. Pastor, or Brother Bill, do you feel any call there to pastor? Well, actually, and, um, and a church, a church great church has been there as, or as a result for many years, which we have had a part in in revival, teaching in their winter fire conferences. And, and um, that's a great man of God who will allow his children who are his right hands, which we did not pursue them, and, and we wouldn't have anyway. But even when they start calling us and say, we feel God's calling us down there to help you as you launch a Bible school, I wouldn't touch it. They can tell you that. Phone call after phone call. And then if I would have even been tempted, my husband said, don't touch that. <laughs> And I said, I won't. I'm just listening to them. But the day came where they said, we know we've heard from God. We're coming. And we finally got a release then to go, so then when you coming? <laughs> and, uh, and what a blessing they are. But this is where it came from, a spiritual heritage, both in the family and the genetics and in the church that they came from, why they're such an asset in this church and, and uh, have such servant's hearts, because I know of nobody who has a servant's heart like this. But I'm going to take a few minutes to ask Pastor Bill if he can just greet us or say whatever God would have him to say. One of these days, we're going to have him as one of your teachers in the Bible school. If we can't physically, we'll work out a way by video because this man is a teaching machine. And uh, we're privileged to have him. Praise God. I feel a little woozy after getting off that airplane the other day. I'm getting a little older, so uh, the body don't respond like it should anymore, but the spirit inside indeed is, is sleeping. Praise God. 
I just want to greet you from North Pole, and I always appreciate Debbie giving that she gives. I think she overdoes it sometimes, but <laughs> either way, I sure appreciate this lady. I've come to love her over the years, and and uh, I don't know of anybody that I trust more or with the Word of God and uh, is as genuine as this lady is. Uh, you won't find anybody other than her husband here who's right by her side and I come to love and appreciate you too, Bob, and uh, the privilege that we have of knowing you over the years. I don't have a lot to say, but I just want to say I feel so privileged to be here this morning, and I want to say, I guess what I want to say is how privileged you should feel in being here. Amen. Amen. I just, uh, I've been aware of some things that God's been showing me. For one thing, for sure, I'm beginning to flow like Debbie is, that revival is the only survival of our families and this nation. And if we don't get to the place where we begin to see what God is doing here, uh, it's, it's an all-important time. These are the days of power in the Holy Ghost. That's what we've got to come to the place to realize the church has got to come back to the power that was in the church. If we're going to do the things that need to be done in this country and this nation, I want to just say some things about our past in the last uh, few years. We've been despondent in this nation. We have felt like that uh, we have been in, in dark days. But let me tell you something. It hasn't been so bad when we begin to see that God has been right in the middle of this all along. Amen. Amen. For one thing that God has done, he has revealed that there's been a separation and division. Now we can see light from darkness. Amen. Amen. So we as a church have no excuse except to begin to move on with God because this is a time when God is beginning to open our eyes and see the needs that are around us. And we have got to get you in the pulp, uh, in the pew qualified to get out and begin to reach our families and to reach our nation. Yes. Amen. So we are privileged to be here in this house. There is a mass of humanity that's not even moved by God today. And folks, you are so privileged that God has drawn you into this place at this particular time. You are here for a particular reason. Yes. Amen. So you need to get yourself stirred up Stir it up with God. Let the Holy Ghost begin to move in your life like he wants to. Disregarding our bodies like I have to kind of disregard mine. So I'm leaping inside, but maybe not so demonstrative on the outside. But either way, I'm excited about what God is doing. And this, this is the time for revival. It's a time when we begin to move and we begin to see God again on the scene. Amen. So glory to God. Get stirred up. These, this week, get, go out and get all your families. Get everybody you can. Pull them into this house. I'm sure we can put some more seats in here, Amen. some more chairs in here. And see, see God make a move next week in revival. We've got some of the best people in the country that's going to be here, the most anointed people to preach the gospel and to deliver the words of, the, of life to us. So you get stirred up, and, and uh, I look forward to it. Uh, uh, it's, it's going to be a time. It's going to be. It's going to be different. It's going to be different. If you come expecting, I believe God is going to do some mighty things. Praise God. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Bill. That was awesome. I love that scripture. Thank you. We're going to receive the tithe and offering at this time. Hallelujah. And around here we clap and we rejoice. And visitors might come in and go, "They must not have heard what she said." <laughs> Because we realize what a privilege it is and that it's not an interruption in the holy. We were just singing holy, holy, holy. And sometimes people will find themselves thinking in meetings, okay, we're going to have this holy, magnificent worship. Then we're going to have the holy, awesome preaching of the word. Then we're going to have this holy altar call time. Where can we put the offering, that unholy, natural part in so we least interrupt it and may, maybe nobody will notice. Pass it fast, guys. Pass it fast. Have Sister Susie sing just right. And maybe they won't even notice we're taking it up. Or, as in the latter years, churches have started putting a box in the back. I hate that. I'll just say what it is. 
because I don't know where anybody's from or what your church does, so I'm safe here. But I hate that abominable thing. It is. It's abominable of putting a box in the back. Anybody ever gone to your dentist or your doctor, and when you left, there was just a box in the back that said, if you enjoyed the service, please feel free to drop something in your way out. You don't have to feel obligated. Anybody ever done that at your doctor or dentist? No, not at your lawyer, not even at the grocery store. Can you imagine, <laughs> instead of ringing up your groceries, uh, what do I owe you today? Oh, there's a box in the back if you feel like putting something in. We only get this ridiculous thinking when it comes to our wonderful, holy God. We don't get that idiotic in the world, in the natural. But the one who's given us everything, our salvation, eternal life, healed our bodies. You know, my insurance bill, this was back in 2006, for that, for that week in the hospital, my insurance bill was $150,000. If, if I wouldn't have had that, that's what I would have owed. And, but even the insurance was hefty enough. I, I think what I was paying at the time for myself and one employee was like fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500 a month. We don't even bat an eye. But when it comes to the one who's given us everything, oh, let's, let's not even mention it. Let's not, let's not make a big deal out of blessing him. Let's not make a big deal out of giving back to him. Let's not make a big deal about the holy sacrifice. Let's just put it out of the way and obscure it. You look all through the Old Testament. Did they obscure the sacrifice? Are you kidding me? Somebody had to buy all those animals, and they made a big deal out of it, and it took hours, and it was at the time of the sacrifice when this had to cost me something that the incense went up before God. It was at this time that the holy fire came down and burned up the sacrifice, and David knew enough when somebody said, look, you're the king. Hey, we're we're going to give you a break. You don't have to pay, you don't have to pay for this field. You, he said, I'm insulted. This isn't buying clothes or something for my kingdom. This is under my God. It can't be free. It can't be nonchalantly skipped over and hidden and just made a cheap thing. This is under my God who's given me the kingdom, given me my wives, given me my children, given me my hands that I work with, given me the heart that beats in my chest, given me everything that I have. Would I say, oh, since it's under him, it's no big deal at all. No, if ever I make a big deal out of something, this is as much a part of worship as, as when we were singing holy, holy, as when somebody takes off dancing in the Holy Ghost, as when somebody's preaching, as when somebody is weeping and running to Jesus as Savior. This is all part of that. It's not a separate, natural, ugly thing. If it was, we shouldn't be doing it at all. Forget trying to do it fast, trying to put it in the back. We just shouldn't be doing it if it's unholy. But if it's a part of us coming back and saying, you get the first fruits, you get the best of my week, the best of my finances, the best of my love, the best of my worship, the best of my hands being lifted, the best of my energy, the best, you are God Almighty. And I remember you first before I pay a bill, first before I plan on retirement, first before I go on vacation, first before I decorate my house, first before I buy a house, my recognition and my worship is unto you first. So no, around here we don't obscure it. I don't care how many people do, and if people walk in and go, I don't know, they make a big deal out of, then, then if we lose them, we lose them. I'm going to do it Bible ways, not modern man tradition, bring God down to where we are. No, we're coming up to where he is. Hallelujah. So anymore, especially on Sunday mornings, I seldom say much of anything about it. But I'm going to come back to teaching like I used to in Holy Ghost Revival or like I did in other pastors' churches on Sunday morning because this is a very important, this is still holy worship. And, and I'm just going to pray before we receive it. Lord, ahead of time, we thank you for, for your people's sacrifice. We thank you for this offering that I believe that you will supernaturally multiply, not only for all the things we're doing this week and the speakers and the worship and and just all of the extra things. But God, just on a daily basis, you're the great multiplier. You're the great blesser. And our hope and our trust is in you. And Lord, we thank you that you will not fail us. But Lord, I add my faith to these individuals and these families. Because you are the one who said, bring me the tithe into the storehouse where you get your food. And prove me. You didn't say try me. You didn't say see if this might work. You said prove me, saith God. If I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing where there isn't room enough to receive it. So, Lord, as these people are proving you, 
I thank you, Lord, that you meet all of their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And Lord, that they come to a new place of blessing because we are called to be a blessing so that we can bless your kingdom and, and other people. And we can't do it if we aren't blessed. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. So, Lord, that's why you said in Deuteronomy 8 that you will give us power to get wealth to establish your covenant, not to heap it upon ourselves, but to establish your covenant. And we believe you for it, and we mix faith with it, and we rejoice. And, yes, we clap with the privilege of offering you this sacrifice this day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. There are envelopes on the back of the chair if you want to give by credit card, debit card, cash, Put your name, please fill it out legibly, not in tongues. And uh, so and fill out everything. Many times we'll get there and half a number's missing or a last name's missing. And then we want to be able to give you credit and do this right. So please fill everything out on your envelope. Who has the privilege of blessing it? Good. I looked this way first, but I wasn't sure. Okay, Brother Jeff. Sister Susie sings so they won't notice what we're doing. <laughs> came to Jesus please come fast Lazarus is sick without your help he will not last Mary and Martha watch their brother die they waited for Jesus he did not come, and they wondered why. The death watch was over. He'd been buried for days. Somebody said, he'll soon be here. Jesus is on his way. Martha ran to him. In doubt she cried. She said, Lord, if you had been here, you could have healed my brother and he'd still be alive. This is what she said. You're four days late and all hope is gone. so long Oh, but His way is God's way It's not yours or mine Oh, and isn't it great when He's four days late He's still on time Jesus said, Martha Take me to the grave but she said, Lord, you don't understand. My brother, he's been dead for days. Oh, the great stone was rolled back. That's when Jesus cried. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Then somebody shouted, he's alive, he's alive. fighting your own battle of fear, sickness, depression doesn't matter what it is you've cried to the Lord I need you now and it seems like he has not appeared oh but friend don't be discouraged oh cause our God's still the same oh he'll soon be here he's gonna roll back stone and he'll call out your name when he's four days late and all hope is gone and you've cried Lord I don't understand why you waited so long oh but his way is God's way I'm so glad it's not yours 
yours or mine. Oh, and isn't it great when he's four days late, he's still on time. My God is great when he's four days late, he's still, he's still, I said, he's still. I tell you, we could go home right now and we have had church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, when he sang that, um, I can't remember if it was last year or when, it, or maybe the year before, it gave me the, the message for the end of that week. He's four days late. And uh, I had a good time getting that message and preaching it. What a tremendous song. The Lord gave me a message for this morning that... Siri's trying to break in on me. I'm not interested in her interrupting me. I didn't know she was going to say I can preach better or what. But, but uh, and this is a message I have never preached before. And part of me wanted to go to my old revival repertoire. And, but as I saw the Lord, I, I can't wait to hear how this comes out myself, the way he was ministering to me. These bones of the Northwest shall live again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you know, somebody was telling me recently that I never even knew this, that Daisy and T.L. Osborne got their start up here. But they got so tired of, of facing, even back then, the liberal devils, they ended up in Tulsa. And then you look at some other mighty revivals that have happened in the Northwest and the Seattle area over the years. You think, dear God, how, let, how did people let go of this? Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. <laughs> That's what happened to me when I got up here. <laughs> it caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. Pastor, Pastor Bill was talking about it earlier. This country has been despondent in dry bones, spiritually dry and caused me to pass by them round about. Behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? He's, saying, he's asking us that this week. Prophesy. Or he first answered, then I answered, oh, oh God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and you will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. There's always a noise in revival. And behold, a shaking. There's always one of those in revival, too. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, and there was no breath in them. You'd think there would be if God was doing something, wouldn't you? Many times there's steps. Many times you've got to keep prophesying. You've got to keep preaching, but I'm getting ahead of myself. And when I beheld, or there was no breath in them, then said he unto me in verse 9, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breathe and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived. And they stood upon their feet in exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dry, and our hope is lost. Sounds like the United States. And we're cut off from our part. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and cause you to come up out of your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it, for Judah and for the children of Israel his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it, for Joseph the stick stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions, and join them one to another into one stick, they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou show us what the meaning by these 
say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick. And they shall be one in mine hand, and the stick whereof thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and whither, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation, one bride, one church here, in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things. You notice God doesn't say, after I do all this, I don't care if they continue to live like this. He says, no, when I put my spirit in you, you don't live like this anymore. Nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, and so shall they be my people, and I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. My tabernacle shall also be with them. Yea, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. I don't usually read a whole chapter when I preach, but I felt it was necessary today. This is talking specifically, obviously, we know this, to Israel. And I want you to know that Ezekiel was 25 years of age when he and his family were carried away to Babylon. How many know that's a very impressionable age? He's a young man to, to, to have it like God deserted them. We're sitting over here in Babylon. Babylon was 900 miles away from where he came from, and it was a horrible time for Israel. And he had now been in captivity for at least 10 years. How many know as a 25-year-old, now you're 35, looks like we've been praying, we've been asking God, nothing's happening here. And when you're a young man like that, it can just seem like, oh, I was born in the wrong time. Nothing's going to happen here. Then God gives him this vision gave them hope when everything looked hopeless. But more than that, when God says it, I said this earlier, no matter who's against you, if God be for you, who can be against you? If he said it, all the hordes of hell cannot stop it. It's going to happen. And it's one thing just to have a vision where you're given hope. It's another thing to have a vision when you're the instrument that is used to change the hopeless situation around where you've got to obey. You've got to get up and do some things, not just, well, I think God's going to do something. He says, I want to do it through you. So get full of me and get up and do it. So in the strictest interpretation of these scripture, Israel's all scattered. He says, I'm going to bring you back from every nation. We've already seen that start to happen. It's in the 40s, and, and what a marvelous miracle. The whole fruition of it will happen will happen later, but he says, I'm going to give them life again. They're going to be living. They'll, they'll be their own nation, which they are. They'll have their own land, which they are. They were once alive unto God. How many know his chosen people? But they became dead. They became adulterous, idolatrous, abominable, idol-worshiping, backslidden people. No matter how much they once knew God, dead because of sin. But now he says, I'm going to bring them back to a proper relationship because I'm a God of restoration. And they're going to live again. This specifically isn't about dead people. Specifically, it's about Israel. But how many know every typology in the Bible? He, he's always given us a message to it. We have plenty in the Bible about dead churches, too, including Revelation, including Laodicea, including if you're lukewarm, I'll spit, spit you out of my mouth, spew you out of my mouth. I've always said being lukewarm is the only thing that gives God the flu. causes them to buy. I don't want to be the one that gives God the flu. When, when he lives in divine divine uh, atmosphere and never been sick. But um, so he talks to dead churches all throughout the Bible, too. Like Israel as a nation. I'm not saying the church. Actually, this, this attitude started to get in the church. And Pastor Bill was talking about it. As a nation, we've been dejected, hopeless. I mean, you, somebody was just telling me the other day when we were talking about youth group leaders down there, they were getting in the Googles, getting where they take anybody down that can't serve anymore. Our time, maybe picking 
But I said, where are we? Are we a communist Russia? Are we in the United States of America? I used to go into these nations and say, we have freedom of speech. We have true freedom. We have. And when you look around at the stuff happening, yeah, it can bring hopelessness. It can, it can bring this, what's going to happen out there? It can bring fear. I wake up some mornings and think, am I in the twilight zone? But then I have to remind myself that when I wake up in the morning and when you wake up in the morning full of the Holy Ghost, it's the devils that run down the sewer pipe saying, oh, no, the man of God is up again. Oh, no, the woman of God is up again. Got to change your focus. But we desperately need the breath of God to blow across here in a great awakening. That's why we're having a Northwest of Lake. There is no hope outside of a mighty spiritual revival. I'm a teacher of the word. I'm a preacher of the word. I got to come down here where you live. I, I at least start out on Sunday morning properly. I'm a teacher and preacher of the word of God, and, and he will only confirm his word. So we have to have faith people. We have to have good people. We have to, that, that's what keeps people from all kinds of junk and all kinds of. However, if just good teaching was going to change the world, it would be done. It's going to be a holy ghost movie of people becoming so, so rachambo corasambo corete with his anointing that they can't sit still without winning souls. They can't sit still without laying hands on everything that moves and casting out devils and seeing the sick recover. But you've got to get set ablaze to do that. Otherwise, you're content to go, well, that was my mom. Hopefully, Brother so-and-so will do that. No, what about you? What about you? Your dead bones have to come back to life. <laughs> Israel isn't going to get revival here because they deserve it, are they? In fact, I want us to back up to Ezekiel 36. You know, after he says in, in uh, oh, there's so much here. He, he says in verse, uh, in 36, verse 26, a new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes, keep my judgments and do them. I'll be your God. He goes on to say, no famine will come on you. And then he goes on to say in verse 30, their whole lamb will be saved from the curse, the fruit of the tree, the increase of the field, no more reproach. And in verse 32, he says, not for your sakes do I do this, saith the Lord God, be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. He emphasized, you corrupt, stiff-necked, rebellious people. I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for my name's sake. I'm doing it for my own glory. I'm doing it to sustain my own covenant. I'm doing it because I'm a God of love and restoration and mercy and grace. Not anything that you merit can do, have done, or will ever be able to do. But he's always all about restoration, not the curse. He is always about grace. Man sin. Man committed high treason, and I don't want to stay here very long because I want to get back into this chapter. But I want to give you a little background here. Time after time after time, man refuses to do it God's way. Man's a lot like Frank Sinatra. I'll do it my way. Thank you, God. He makes Adam and Eve in the garden. He says, multiply, subdue, take dominion, have your way. Basically, I know uh, a word of faith movement has been criticized for this, but he basically says, I'm king up here, you're king down there, according to my word. I declare it up here, you declare it down there. And when you declare it according to my word, I'll back you up with my declaration up here. I want you to rule and reign on this earth, Adam. Walk in authority, the authority I've given you. And we know the story. Eve ate them out of the house and home. We read about the fall. The devil thinks he has ruined God's plan. I mean, if we could watch in those, those dominions in that realm, they're having a picnic, they're having a party. We ruined the whole plan of God. Did you see how much God loved that man? And we have messed up his whole plan. They never understood that this God of restoration, grace, and mercy, and love always has a way. Always has a way. And so, but I want to back up to when he first made man. Psalm 8 tells us, and it's, it's repeated again in the New Testament, what is this man that thou art? Who is this guy? The angels, the cherubim, and the seraphim flying around his throne continually looking at him. Look at this. Who are these people? Because the Bible says that God, when man sinned, 
The reason Adam and Eve felt naked wasn't just because they suddenly didn't have clothes on. They never had clothes on. But what were they clothed in? The Bible says he clothed them in his own blood. He, he said, Adam, I'm not going to eat with you. We've got to have us a fornication service. And he looked through heaven, my gold, the, the, or what my streets are made out of. People always say they're paved with gold. That's not what the Bible says. They're made of gold all the way down. But he says, I can take some of that, but no, that's not good enough for my man. They are so special. I can take some one of the great big huge pearls at my gates. That's not special enough for my ma'am. I can take some of my sapphires. Not special enough for my ma'am. What can I do to crown this ma'am with? And he crowns ma'am with his very own substance, his Shekinah, his heavy weight, his splendorous light, his character, his integrity, his everything that the glory of both. He says, I'll take that, some of that out of myself. And boom, that's what you're clothed with. The angels are watching and going, they, they don't get some golden crown. They get God's glory. Who are these people? How did they raise? And then when they fell, and the devil thought it's over, and the angel thought it's over. about restoration. He comes and walks in my house. Look what I got for you. Animal skins dripping in blood. And these this blood will at least clothe your nakedness. But I'm going to teach you about the blood covenant and how my son's going to come and take care of this sin problem once and for all. This doesn't take care of it once and for all, but it allows you so you don't even blow up in my presence. Because sin and glory can't cohabitate. He's always about restoration. Always. I look at my life. I, I said something a little earlier. A lot of you know all my testimony. Some of you know some of them. Some of you don't know any of them. But I'll tell you this. When you're, when you're 30, 35 years of age, and your husband, the father of your three kids, walks out the door with your best friend after 18 years of abuse, and, and you've got a wrecked car that your son's wrecked trying to learn how to drive it, and... <laughs> And you're living in with other people in your church. And it doesn't look too promising when you say I'm called to the nations, <laughs> called to go all over the world. In fact, you know, I had the betrayal because that lady had been my best friend up in Alaska. And I thought I'm 5,000 miles away from home in Nebraska where I originally come from. It pretty much looked all over. And if it didn't look all over enough, preachers come out of the woodwork to tell you it's all over. Pastor Bill knows about that. And without going back into that detail, I mean, it was over. The vision was done. The calling was done. The money was done. Not that I ever had any much before that, but it now it's really done. Everything was done, except for God says, when I put my mark on you, when I brand you with my Holy Ghost, when I put my heavenly call upon you, these bones shall live again. He's always about restoration. That's quite the restoration. When you find yourself, we can't go everything from step one to step two. But when you find out that you're getting the privilege, Pastor Rodney says, I'm having a conference. I'm, I'm having a few little speakers in, R.W. Sandbox, T.L. Osborne, Reinhardt Bonke, and I want you to be the other one. <laughs> I grew up listening to these people on the radio and getting T.L. Osborne's magazines. What? Or then you're standing at Madison Square Garden going, I'm off the village floors. What am I doing here? To these thousands of people and the glory of God. Or, or you're, you're at Royal Albert Hall in London, England, where the queen has her own box. And people are running everywhere when I'm finished preaching going, I didn't even know women could carry the fire. And, and you're going, how? Ah, it was all over. It was all over. Then people say, can I fly you out? to my side of the country and put you on three days of television all over the world, no cost to you. I think so. And then gives you a check for doing it. I didn't know I'd get that too. Then you go into other nations and they say, we're putting you on television for these several weeks into 100 and something, 60 some nations. And, and, and you never forget. I have people say all the time, we love it about you, Debbie, that you never forget where you came from. And I always say, how do people do that? Do they suddenly conk their head and get amnesia? I mean, I don't even get that statement. How could you ever forget that I was nothing? I could do nothing. I knew nothing. 
I made mistakes. I didn't handle everything the best. I didn't, and it was all over. And whether it was other people doing it to you or you do it yourself, it, it, you still need the blood and you still need restoration. And you still need a big God to come on the scene. And you need those bones to come back together. And you need to have a shaking. And you need to have the sinews and the, the skin and the flesh come on. And then you need the breath of the Holy Ghost. And then people say, what happened to you? I think they honestly think you're going to write down a piece of paper. Well, I packed three dresses and a suitcase and put my toothbrush in. And I got somebody to buy me a plane ticket. And I, I don't even know what they want you to tell them. And they say, how did you do that? I always, and I think people are tired of it because I've sang this all over the world. Now, he touched me. That's how I did it. He touched me. Oh, yeah, I know. I know I like that song too. But I mean, like, for real, how did you do it? And, oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something marvelous happened. And now I know he touched me. That's how it was. He touched me. That's why I have meetings like this, so we can touch somebody else, no matter what it costs us, no matter with our few that happen to work in about 20 departments. You should have seen our, our, our little uh, meetings here. Can you, can you do claws? Can you greet? Can you, can you do the ready room? Can you do sound more? Can you do, oh, yeah, yeah, because we have those kind of people. Why do we want that? Because I want somebody to say he touched Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I stood at Ramah on the 10th of every month, where, where one of the Bible schools I went to, the 10th of every month, because you had to pay on the 1st, and they gave you till the 10th before they kicked you out. I'm in the 10th every month for the entire two years. How embarrassing, because you miss a whole class, and if there's a long line, you miss two classes. So now you get absences, you get so many of them, your grade's going to get docked. I'm standing there, because I've taken back top 10, seriously, for my last 25 cents, 26, 28. I'm really dishing out pennies because I made it another month. So thankful. So thankful. Oh, my God. So thankful. But you don't go from taking your pennies to flying around the world without something happening. He touched me. Tangible, transmittable anointing. <laughs> so back to our story here. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. This starts, uh, you can't do it with nice organization. If, if we had a church of a thousand and the best organization in the world, as far as, yes, this, these people will handle this this week, and the, you would not be able to touch that with the best organization. I don't care how many water bottles they hand out, how many smiles they put in your face. It's not going to change your life. We try to do things in the spirit of excellence, but none of that's going to change your life. I don't care how good of a voice Brother Jeff has, it's not going to change your life. I don't care if I'm a good preacher or anybody else coming in to preach. We know how to do the three points. We know when to get quiet. We know when to get loud. We know when to summarize. It's not going to change your life. Not an orator, not a singer, not a greeter, not, not what's going to change your life is the power of the Holy Ghost demonstrating his word. So he starts out, he doesn't say, I was, I was just trying to figure out how I can make Israel come back to God, and how we can have restoration. No, the Holy Ghost says, who let me handle this? I'm carrying you away. You've got to know how to yield. You've got to know how to be carried away. You've got to have that divine touch. It starts with Acts chapter 2. It's how the church was birthed. It's how the church continues. It's how the church has victory. It's how the church shall go out. You can't do it in anything less than Acts chapter 2. You can't do it with programs. You can't do it with Hebrew and Greek. You can't do it with vacation Bible school. You can't do it with enough department heads. You can't do it with enough microphones and enough YouTube going. It has to be by the Korasapa Chambro Koti Lime Sombreske. Anything less than that is religion. Hallelujah. That's why we emphasize the move of the Spirit. Anybody who turned anything around in the Bible or history, it was done by the Holy Ghost through them divinely. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, it's the substance of the Holy Spirit. It 
Why did the church say, well, that was then, that's how it was birthed, but now we can do it on our own. We can do it our way. We can't. We still do it completely by him. Galatians 3, 3, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh, your own programs, your own way of doing everything? Ephesians tells us, don't be drunk with wine, wherein is in excess, but instead, be ye being filled all the time. Speak unto yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is how the church sees the dead moment come alive again. First, they had to have, he had to have a divine assessment of the situation. He set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He caused me to pass them round about. What does that mean? He, he, don't just look at it from this side, Ezekiel. Yeah, I want you to look at it from over here. I want you to look at it from over here. Ooh, yeah, they really look dead. And when I stand on this side, I'm seeing how brittle and dead they are. And from over here, they're very dead. I want you to look at what you're going through. Don't bury your head in the sand. Don't pretend it's okay when it's not. Some people say, oh, we just need to look at what's going on. Now, I, that's a whole other message. I can't stay here because we got too much to cover in a few minutes here. But if we people go together and just keep their eyes on all the world situations and decide what God can do or can't do by that, our, our plan and our purpose is to stay right in the middle of his word and the Holy Ghost, no matter what they do out there. Don't get so involved in that that, huh, my guy doesn't get in and has done everything in disaster. My God's still on the throne, no matter who gets in. On the other hand, then you got people that think the church isn't supposed to be involved with anything. They don't know anything. You, you say, did you hear what happened last night? No, I don't know. Oh, my God, where's our precious Bible? Okay. I mean, just total, totally oblivious. He says, look at your situation. Look at where you're at in the first place. Look at what you're up against. Look at the legality. Look at what's going on. I'm going to give you a plan. So it involves counting the cost. If you don't look at it, you won't count the cost. Don't think, oh, well, yeah, God's in it. I can do it. I can. No, he says, if you're going to do anything, count the cost because it's going to cost you. Are you prepared? Are you looking at the situation? I'm going to talk about some things tomorrow morning that's involving you and us, some things we're spearheading, what God is asking us to do legally in this state. And we're doing it just not for us. We're doing it for all of you and everybody that comes back. It's a big job. But we have to keep looking at the situation around us and say, God, which way do you want us to go? And what's the time? And when do we do this? And when do we do that? There is a time that you've got to have a Holy Ghost war room in place. Those of you who saw the movie War Room, how do you want us to pray? How do you want us to intercede? How do you want us to give? How do you want us to vote? How do you want us to... Uh, to fast? How do, how do you want us to talk to somebody? How do you want us to write letters? How do you want to do it, Lord? you got to assess the situation. When I came up here, I saw a lot of dry bones. That's not insulting, but when, when you're part of the greatest revival church in the world and you're dropped in the Northwest, you know, God died. Nobody told me. No. <laughs> and and, and you're, you're up against you can't even believe the liberal stuff. I mean, you're down there in Florida one minute, you know, where, I mean, even politically it's conservative, whatever that means anymore. That's not getting it mean very much. But, but, I mean, all of a sudden you're like, where am I? You know, and, and, and they come up from Tampa to train us how to win souls up here. And, and uh, their team went, oh, no, there will be no problem doing this at Walmart. I'm like, okay. Because they don't have a problem in Tampa. They go there and the police come and they rent off the parking lot. Where are we? Oh, there will be no problem doing this over here. They're run out. Where are we? You've got to assess the situation sometimes and realize I'm going to, God brought me off in the middle of dry bones. In fact, I'll just tell you, I already told the church that the last couple weeks we've been talking about hunger for a number of weeks, getting ready for this week. One of the things I made the mistake of complaining to the Lord about, you know, sometimes how dumb can you get and still breathe? First of all, you don't complain to him, period. But I asked him, question but at the time you, you never realize you're being stupid until it's done coming out of your mouth and like oh his answer his answer isn't going to be good his, I said Lord I don't get it. It, it you you taught me the principles of giving and I came out of poverty and was blessed and so many people have gotten blessed from it all over the world and you send me up here where people don't want to hear about it and they're all in poverty and Grace Harbor County is is the most impoverished and greatest unemployment and greatest drug addiction and greatest alcoholism and greatest blah, 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 and 
okay, living off the government. Here's where you should be. I didn't get that. And as soon as it was off my mouth, I'm like, I get that, but go ahead, Lord. <laughs> he says, where would I send somebody as a friend to somebody who already has it and doesn't need it, where everybody knows it and is teaching it? Or would I send them to where they don't know it and they got to have what you have? Oh, yeah, I guess that makes an amount of sense, Lord. God, I'm a revivalist. And people want a one-hour dry cleaning service. Where would I send a revivalist to except the people who need revival? Okay, Lord, I just don't get stoned in the process. We'll just keep going. Just keep going. You've got to look at the dry bones. and You've got to go, God has given me something to resurrect them. I tell you, even in Alaska, I had to assess the situation. When he went out the door with the other woman, I looked at my boys. My youngest one was nine. He was crying. He's going to have to give up his puppy while we go live it with other people. And, and I thought, man, I'm 5,000 miles away from home. I have no money. I have a total wreck car. Moose are standing out in my yard. I can't even get to the total wreck car when I need to go to the store or something because I can't. I mean, they got, they're standing with a calf. It's not a good idea to go shoo, shoo. It's just. <laughs> and, uh, and I was feeling sorry for myself. And I thought, do I go home? Oh, and people called me out of the woodwork to tell me why I should go home. Like I said, preachers on down. My own dad called me and says he, he wasn't walking with the Lord. Have you for, forget this stupid missionary idea? Are you out of your mind? Those three boys are going to starve to death, and, and we don't have any money to help you, and you just need to get home. So I was receiving advice all over the place. The faith preacher said, you're a woman, you're alone, you're going to starve and freeze. And so that was the faith preacher. So I didn't have too many places to really go get encouragement. And, and, uh, and I had to assess the situation. First time, I didn't even want to go up to Alaska. I followed him up there. So now I'm free to do what I want to. Maybe it's time to go home. But I kept him on both shoulders. I used him to get you up there. He should have been at your side, and, and, but he chose another way. But I've got you where I want you. I'll show you what great things I can do through a little lady all by herself with a big gun. That's what this week is about. We start out in, the, in a prison ministry to fill in for somebody else who was sent, and revival exploded in that prison. Till, till men are getting saved, delivered from drug addiction, witchcraft, murder, all over the place. We go to baptize them in water, and they're all falling out. Nobody even has to dunk them. All the prison is watching this. It explodes. It goes into the other prison system. And we could have gone home when we assessed the situation. The dry bones. Did nothing but substituting in a prison in a church with about 20 people. I'm out in the wilderness. Well, you got to do what you're supposed to look too good. I'm assessing it. Check in, that's what we do about that. And then we go to get them from here. From yours on down to the rest of us. He says we're dry, we're without hope. I tell you what, when you're dead, no purpose, no passion, no productivity, you're dead. No help. People are out there without God, without Christ, they have nothing. That's why we see them so hopeless in Grace Harbor. You go down any street and you see them talking to themselves and bobbing, and you, you just go, Dear God, these people are so lost. That's the dry bones we're called here to make a difference with. A man of God said, I personally believe in the sovereignty of God in the affairs of men, but I do not believe in any concept of revival that eliminates man's responsibility. God is the God of revival, but we are his instruments, his agents through which revival is possible, and I say not only possible, through which it will happen. So he assessed the situation, then he was to proceed with divine expectancy. He said, son of man, can these bones live? You've got to look through God's eyes. You look at the drug addict, you look at the unemployment around here. Michelle over here is an ICU nurse, and the stuff she says she sees in the hospital every night, I just weep. I can't tell you about it, but it's unbelievable. The tragedies and families and children and prostitutes and drug addicts. And it's everywhere. It takes somebody who can see what nobody else can see. It takes you and I reading the end of the book. It takes us seeing that we are seated with Jesus Christ in heavenly places and the enemies under our feet. It takes us seeing we're to rule and reign and walk back into that authority that's been restored. We have the keys of the kingdom. Get up and prophesy to these dead bones. Huh. 
Call those things that be not as though they are. I don't know, Pastor Debbie, did you hear now about the latest news report? Call those things that be not as though they are. Believe what nobody else will. Have some faith to see it come to pass, a dream, a vision, and then get out and obey like nobody else does. Oh, I don't know, Pastor, that sounds too hard. I'm so busy. Then don't do it. I'm giving you an opportunity to get in with me because it's going to take all of us. But if you don't do it, I'll do your part and my part because I'm going to obey like it's all up to me. Hallelujah. He looks for somebody to get his word back in the earth. Prophesy. Preach. Teach. Say what I say. Hallelujah. He doesn't want any more division either. He's bringing Israel back into one. He's tired of that. But it's about order of rank in the kingdom. We're, we'll be talking about that in the Bible school and submission and authority. But out here in the Northwest, I want to do it my way. We even talked about dress code the other night. Some people will give up the call of God in their life and see miracles because they don't want to dress up. They, they are just worthy of being dressed. And ours isn't nearly what I had to wear to go through. But the whole purpose is no army on the face of the earth says, come, get up when you want to. Come in when you want to. Go home when you want to. Wear whatever you want to. Do it any way you want to. And let's win this war. No army does it except God's. That's so sad. So sad. Divine assignment. Pray, prophesy, preach. And do it with divine urgency. Prophesy unto these bones and say to them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. He had it on the word of the Lord. We got that. Pastor Debbie, can you prophesy over me this week at Northwest of Lake? Okay, I'm going to do it right now. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. You don't even need another word. You got that one. <laughs> it amazes me. I said this in the Bible school the other night when we were talking about prophecy and how flaky people can get. It amazes me that somebody will say, God has a word for you, sister. I watch it all the time, and I'm always laughing where I'm sitting. They say, God wants you to say yes. I said, no. Who were Uh, I think you could have read that in, in the Bible. Um, people don't even want to do what the book says, and they want all these extra words. We got the word of the Lord, a sovereign word, a saving word, a sure word. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. For all the promises of God are yea and amen. Hallelujah. I've got so many verses here about promises, the exceeding great and precious promises. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So you could grab that scripture and you could run with it. He was to proclaim with divine authority. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. We have the keys of the kingdom. Anybody think we have? We don't have enough weapons to get it done even here in the Northwest? Uh, Oh, I forgot. They do have the keys of the kingdom in the other states, but not in the Northwest. They do have the name of Jesus Christ in the other states, but we don't get that, right? Yeah, we do. They do have the blood everywhere else, but did we get left out of that? No. They do have the word of God everywhere else. Did we get left out? No, we got it. They have this precious salvation, and guess what? So do we. They are baptized in the Holy Ghost. So are we. We... We weren't shortchanged no matter where we live. You could take this into India and see it work. Take it into Nepal and see it work. Take it into China and see it work. Take it into Haiti and see it work. One man, one woman full of the Holy Ghost, and the airwaves have to separate when you get off the plane. Hallelujah. Now, we like to use excuses of how hard it is where we live. I, I, I read a couple weeks ago about a man named Hans Nelson Helga. I can't go back over the whole story, but one man in the 1700s in Norway. I'll make that long story a whole lot briefer. He is out. He is out plowing in the father's field. 17 years old. He starts singing a hymn in the reality of Revelation. He is baptized in the Holy Ghost. Had to be the Holy Ghost. Baptized in the Holy Ghost. Falls out in the field. Leaves his dad's farm the same day and starts walking down the gap in the fields, knitting and prophesying. And as he did, only only the state church, only the priests could preach in that day. They kept throwing him in prison. He was in prison more than he was free over the next 10 years. They put him in a solitary confinement. 
and they threw a prostitute in. He had been in there without seeing any daylight or anything for a year. The prostitute comes running out, weeping. I just met Jesus. This man was so full of the Holy Ghost. They let him out every time Norway was in a depression again because he, he, he was walking around prophesying. You need, you need a, a mill there, a water mill there. You, you need, a, you need a, a cotton over here. Or what, I, I can't even remember all the different businesses. And they would start, and the whole nation would prophesy. Then they'd bring him back in jail, and the whole nation would go down. So they'd let him out and say, we need some business going. Let Hans Nelson out again. This man started a movement that caused Norway to get their independence from Denmark and started a mighty revival that swept through the nation all these hundreds of years later. One man wasn't even at a northwest ablaze. He just got a revelation all by himself that there's a God in the heavens. Turned the whole nation upside down. Prophesy, Ezekiel. I started looking. He had to prophesy four times. Most people would just say, okay, I've got to prophesy to get both to live. I don't get why. Well, they did come back together, but I don't get why there's no life in like that. I tried. Get back up and do it again. Get back up and do it again. Get back up and do it again. Many times in the Bible, somebody was asked to prophesy God's will into the situation. He always looks for somebody to stand in the gap and to have enough desire to do so. We've spent about four weeks around here on the subject of desire. And boy, did we have a service last Sunday night. People running, people in tongues, people everywhere, people falling out of their seats. What a night. And it was all about desire. David said, this one thing have I desired, not a whole bunch of things, not spreading my desire out everywhere. I'm focusing it in on this one thing, to live in your holy house and praise and worship you and to acquire of a holy God all the days of my life. This one thing, this one thing. Paul said it another way, forgetting everything that lies behind me. Oh, I haven't got started yet. Uh, oh, forgetting that and pressing on for the high call of God in Christ Jesus. Desire exalts the object of its longing and sets its mind on it, has choice, has fire, has attitude. Do we really feel this desire for heavenly stuff, heavenly treasure? I've been reading E.M. Bounds' book on prayer. Now, that's a book that sets you ablaze in prayer. But he says, he says, does your inward groaning of desire stir your soul to mighty breastplates? True prayer must be a flame. Fiery souls are those who conquer in the day of battle. There are those from whom the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and who will take it by force. Do we want to see something in the Northwest we've never seen? Then we've got to take it by force. It's not going to fall on us like ripe cherries off a tree. We've got to take it by force, church. The stronghold of God is taken only by those who storm it in worship, false presence, earnestness, besiege it with fiery, unshakable zeal the kind of desire that causes us to overcome obstacles that would be insurmountable. I've had a couple in my life. I'm sure you have too. You're going to die slightly in some of these things. Then I had another one. Now you're going to die again, something different this time. By now you start to get used to it. Yeah, yeah, I heard that before from the devil, then God. In whatever order you want to put that in. <laughs> but my God's bigger. He's bigger. People, weaker people, will give in to those obstacles, but not people who see the vision. Prayer is really closely related to prophesy, prophecy. I was thinking about it the last couple days and just meditating on it, especially for those who baptized the Holy Ghost. We're supposed to be praying in the Holy Ghost. Cop and sheep go, 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 and we're supposed to be interpreting in the Holy Ghost. There's a very fine line to the Spirit of God leaps up on the inside of you, and you begin to prophesy things into existence. Prophecy is supernatural utterance in the known tongue. The Holy Spirit is our helper in prayer. So they're so closely tied together. Let's prophesy some things into this area. I'm not talking about the flaky stuff people do that try to practice. But, oh, that's a whole other story. We can't even start that. I'm talking about according to the Word of God, according to what He's called us here to do. He just called somebody and transported them across the country and told them to start a Bible school. It was at this meeting. See how important this meeting is? This meeting last year that I heard it come out of my mouth this time. And I'm standing outside myself hearing that like, it's what? We don't have the money, the building, the people. That it's what? That's why we got one today. Because we prophesied it. Lost in the Holy Ghost in the middle of a supernatural meeting. Yeah. Hallelujah. 
the English, I did some study, and I've been reading a lot of stuff in prayer because I'm getting ready to teach on it one of these days in Bible school. But I found some stuff out the last couple of days that have escaped me. Now, I'm going to get a little cheeky just for a couple minutes, and then we'll, we'll explain this about the Holy Ghost. But I want you to see something. This excited me. The English definition of prayer doesn't match exactly with the Bible prayer. That's why I can't talk to the charismatic or often accuse the presumptuous of the command or declare something that is sufficient to ask God for it and beseech God for it, sister. They got a popular view, but it's a religious cow view. It's a traditional view. The root of the Greek word used for prayer is vow. And since God knows everything beforehand, including the intentions of your heart and my heart, it's not necessarily the speaking part that makes prayer pray. That is the verbal expression of what's going on in the heart. Faith, being sure of what is hoped for and certain of what we don't see, according to Hebrews 11.1. 1. But James tells us Elijah was a man just like us, does he not? With like passion, just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, right? And it didn't rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed and the heavens gave their rain and, the, the, and produced the crop. I want us to look at how he prayed. Oh, God, who art in heaven, would you please give? I want you to look at this. In 1 Kings 17, 1, when we first see him introduced, it's now Elijah the Tishbite said to Ahab, is he talking to God? I wouldn't call Ahab God, not by a long shot. But he's the only one he's declaring this to. He's not talking to God. He says to God, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will neither be dew nor rain in the next two years except at my word. Wow. Here is his prayer. There won't be any rain, Ahab, except at my word. He prays in the name of the Lord, Jehovah. Today we would in Jesus Christ. And it is a, if I got into a lot of teaching stuff that even had my mind going of all the verbs and the indicative. But basically, I can shorten it to this. Prayer is a toward vow. It's toward, it's about God, it's in his name, it's toward him. But it doesn't always have to be just talking to him. He says, there will be no work rain at my word. He prays in the name of God, but doesn't address God. He says it will be according to his Elijah's word, because he's already heard from God. Wow. Now, the second prayer that James is referring to in 1 Kings 18, 41, Elijah said to Ahab again, not to God, go eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. He made a toward vow, wish, will of faith. Again, he does not address God. It was by faith and not by sight. At that time, he says, I hear the sound. His servant hadn't even seen the first cloud the size of a man's hand yet. There was nothing. But he says, I hear the sound. The reason we're having a Northwest ablaze in a Bible school is because I heard a sound in the Holy Ghost, in the spiritual realm, that people shall be running out of this place all over, setting fires, starting churches, other Bible schools, missionaries, evangelists, I hear a sound. There is a sound in revival. I hear it in Jeff's voice. I hear it in my own preaching. I hear it in people on the floor wailing and laughing. and run. I, I hear it when people are running around the building panting. It's the sound of revival. <laughs> the Bible says Elijah didn't even pay any attention to this guy. If I'm saying this in God's name, anybody see anything yet? He didn't even look. It says he bent his head to the ground. He can't even see the sky. It was, it was a, a vow in faith. As long as I'm here and pronounce this, the heavens are about to give way. I hear a sound of the abundance of rain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. Later, the servant sees the cloud. Mm -mm -mm. A lot of churchianity says we can only re entreat repeatedly, ask and beg. Now, I talked about persevering prayer in the last few weeks, too. So there is a time. But you've got to know these things by the Holy Ghost. It's not just if I keep asking something, I know a person with this heart. Well, here in a row, pray tell Sister Maggie to play. You know, if no faith is spoken in that, you don't have faith. People trying to fast to convince God they're serious. But when some of us by the Holy Ghost just declare how something's going to be, I command this sickness to go in Jesus' name. I command the weather to change in Jesus' name. 
I command this Bible school school to come forth in Jesus' name, despite every liberal hierarchy at the head of the state. People will take offense at us. Who do you think you are? Maybe they think this stuff is just for Elijah and a few special people. James said he was just like you and I. Just like you and I. But he was passionate about what was wrong in Israel. He was tired of the, the bail worship, tired of what Ahab was allowing. He said, I'm going to do something about it. we got to get so passionate. I'm sick of this being sick of it. We talked about the sycamore tree a few weeks ago. You got I'm so sick of my problem, sick of my disease, sick of my poverty, sick of my lethargy, sick of my depression, that you got to get up and see it change. you got to do something about it, but you got to do things legally. God has to do them legally. He started through the first Adam. They were supposed to rule and reign. We talked about it. They, they just handed it over to Satan. You take. I tell you what, Christians are still doing that. God says, here's the keys. Christians go, God, you use them. You take them, God. He goes, no, I've given them to you. No, you take them, God. I've given them to you. No, you take them, God. And the devil reaches up and goes, thank you. I'll take them. See, you can't decide who to believe. you got to use what we got. Operate God's kingdom the way it's supposed to be operated for the needs of the world and lay hold. You got to get ready to call the impossible possible. I kept hearing it's impossible to get this building. We said it that way. So now when I hear it's impossible to have a school, I just that's why it was impossible for me to live. And then they said, now you've lived, but you'll never preach again. You'll never have enough breath to. Really, we're standing in the middle of an impossible thing made possible at the moment. You've got to see the impossible is quite possible because to my God, all things are possible. When somebody can believe him, see him, pray, declare, wait on him, get up and swing the bat every which way but loose. The earth has changed. It's revolutionized. Our highest office is to pray and declare what he declares. The condition, according to Psalm 2, 7 through 9, he says, ask of me. Ask of me. Ask of me. That's the condition. Prayer is God's condition to move ahead his son's kingdom. It takes somebody who can see what nobody else can see. You've got to believe it can happen, and then it will be completely fulfilled. Now, very quickly, I'm not going to get where I wanted to get today. I should have known this came in my own thing, offering, but that's okay. This is a special week of meeting. We're finding out today how to change the Northwest where we live. So I think it deserves a little extra time because it's sure been this way for a long time. And nobody took enough time to see what it takes to change it. He remakes the body. God's a God of order, not chaos. He puts bones on it. The frame on purpose. He does it. Anything. That's why you've got to have a strong foundation to move this forward. That's why some people that like the move of the Holy Ghost with their flesh here and they're like, yeah, never have the word foundation. You've got to have the bones, the frame, the foundation for the Holy Ghost to move upon. He's not going to move upon any whim and anything we want. And there's a shaking of those bones. You see people sometimes in revival, uh, like, I don't know, I was offended by that. Do you think that's really God that they're shaking like that? I said, are you kidding me? When the God of the universe that just said, there, let there be light, and there was light, he made everything by the spoken word. That God comes and sits on you when you put up these Holy Ghost antennas in the spiritual rain. You put up antennas in the rain, what's going to happen? You, you put up these antennas in Holy Ghost rain, and you say, come, come. Do anything you want to do. Come and sit on me. Come lay on me. And he does, and you're shocked that somebody shakes. I'm only shocked that our whole heads don't blow off. Anytime he shows up, there was a shaking of dead bones. And the life hadn't come into him yet. But when God comes on the scene, I'm dead, but I'm still going to shake. And then you see, every time they, they had a good prayer meeting, the whole building was shaking. God doesn't shock me. try to say that when you're already half drunk in the Holy Ghost. Doesn't shock me. There's the shaking. <laughs> huh, I better be real careful there. <laughs> he starts at the bones, then the skin, the outer covering, the breath of life. I think we're getting a little hint how he probably originally made man. Because when he's redoing it, this is how he does it from the bones on out. The nation is symbolic of the graves from all these the tribes of Israel will be gathered. God will save them, put the Holy Ghost in them. I prophesied, and the breath came into them in verse 10. Revival. 
They were vitalized. They were energized. They stood up in their feet. Sometimes people get a shaking. I've seen it, believe me, traveling the world in revival all these years. I've seen people, ah, ah, ah. you come back the next night, where are they? Oh, they went to the fair. You're like, what? And people are like, that must not have been the whole, oh, that was the Holy Ghost. That was the Holy Ghost working on their dead bones. But they needed to come back and get some life in them all the way. So, that, so they don't just get a touch, but they're totally changed. Hallelujah. So they stood up on their feet. The whole purpose of this touch is so that we become the mighty marchers, that we're mobilized to do something in this earth, to move, to march. We have a mission. They said, but our bones are dry. Our hope is lost. We are cut off from God. Any, anybody ever said that? So he says, prophesy to him again. I'll open your graves. I'll cause you to come out of your grave. Uh, Pastor Debbie, I kind of get part of what you're saying. I want to be there, but I just feel so old. I just feel so weak. I just feel so tired. I just feel so sick. And I said, I, I, I'm willing. The, the hearts want to spare is going to come up and let me just touch you. Then let's release for his life to touch from our bones to our sinews to our, our skin to our spirits to our emotions. Until we become the mighty army we're called to be in this hour. Restoration. You'll know that I'm God and that I've opened up your graves, brought you out of them. I shall place you in your own land. And he predicts a whole bunch of things. You'll live. I'll put breath in you. You'll know that I'm Jehovah. I'll open your graves. I'll cause you to come out. I'll bring you into the land. You'll know that I'm God Almighty. Uh, uh, I'll put my spirit in you. I'll place you in your own land. You'll know. He keeps saying these things over and over and over again. He's going to do this by his spirit until they live in his presence eternally and know that he's fulfilled it. He takes the two sticks. He writes on them. You know the whole story. I'm going to make it fast. Both divisions of the kingdom becoming one again forever and ever and ever upon the mountains of Israel. I tell you, God likes mountains. I know why. I, I, so many things I like God about. I realize the more I read his word, the more I got about he likes fast cars. He does. When Job was in trouble, he pulled up in a whirlwind. I mean, it makes a bet look like a pokey. He, he, he likes mountains. I love mountains. You're, you're, you're going to be brought back together in the mountains of Israel forever and ever and ever. One nation forever under the Messiah. Why? Because they're going to be the ones that change the lives of the world. That's why he's doing it. Not because they deserved it. Because he said, i got to have the world come to me. You're the ones used for it. So I'm going to take away your division. I'm going to take away every curse off of you. I'm going to take away all the could have, would have, should have that you might have done differently in your life. I'm going to take away your approach. I'm going to take away what everybody says you can or cannot accomplish. I'm going to take away your regret. I'm going to take away all of it. And you're going to be used to set this world ablaze as a mighty, mighty army prophesy. Speak out in the Holy Ghost last year, Debbie. It's time to start a school. If it amazes you as you speak it out, you'll know that much more. It's me. I'm just like that. Anytime I've really been carried away, the Spirit is like that. If it was something I'd like, you know, I've been thinking about, I think we've got enough people to do this. I think we have enough of money. That wouldn't even be God. But when it comes out of your mouth, I don't, I don't see how. Anyway, I didn't say it, you did. In that state of worship, he still say the same thing. He said, they think they tempted the king. They think they tempted the king. We've talked about that in depth. We need to see that. See what the Lord's laid on your heart, what they've said, what the accreditation people have said, what Pastor Roger has said, what Sister Kim has said. What uh, Dr. Anderson has said, and what's really going on out there, and why we're called to do this. Now, I believe I'm looking at the people that feel called to do it with us. So many of you have already stepped up to the plate. So I'm not declaring the error of you. I'm not proclaiming the error of you. But if I had to leave you in there, some of you would get upset with me. I don't want you to get upset with me because there's several of you in here. But that's just a small piece of the puzzle of this. One reason we aren't full today 
is about every church is in the county, as far as I can read, is settled in for the dry cleaning service, for the what we call keeps the tongue, whatever it is. I do the soup any day of the week just to go home and go home and watch the kids eat my soup before I will play religious games of the Holy Ghost that I have on the inside of me can't even go back. Why? He touched me. Maybe he hasn't you. Maybe you can settle for religiosity. I can't. He touched me. So we aren't going to play the modern games. But there will be enough of Gideon to get stuck. It's always been a remnant. Whether it's Gideon's army that came in. Tell them to go home, says Gideon. Tell them to go home. Tell them if they don't understand it, tell them to go home. <laughs> That's why we have these Holy Ghost drinking nights. Tell them. Tell them. Tell them something. <laughs> you know what? It would be a lot more comfortable for me to stay in Phoenix. I just I turned past Rodney on this morning and I haven't done that for a while. We're always so busy as ministers, but I did it. He was gone. And Brother Eric was preaching, which he, he does an awesome job. And usually I listen to whoever's preaching. I'm like, no, I haven't listened so long. you got to find something else. So I just start going through. Okay, that looks good. The anointing part sex. I've never heard one of these people talk, but let's just say this. And, and of course, everything he, he was preaching on that, I don't even know which conference it was because I'd go in the other room. I could just hear him preaching. But I thought, I thought oh, I'm just sitting there. And I'm thinking about the good time they're having in Tampa today and how easy that is to sit there and bake that to that. And, and you know, then you're all, I just think of all the television I'd be on now. They were just getting that started. And all the day they're just, sure, that'd be easy. But then what does the Northwest do? Go to some religious church and keep doing things the way they've always been done? We don't get to do, folks. Let's see. You've probably figured that out by now. <laughs> We don't get to do and go the way of the flesh. We don't get to go, I'll put your feet to the corporate thing of God and it will soften you or whatever. No, he didn't take those feet. No, this one thing. To obey you completely, obediently, sell out to you, yield to you, run with you, never look back because this life is but a vapor. I suddenly got alive. My microphone got alive. <laughs> I'm like, I don't think it's moved. I haven't touched it. <laughs> it just went, boy, I'm liking this, Debbie. I'm going to come right on up. <laughs> we are here this week <laughs> to have such a Holy Ghost impartation, Holy Ghost direction, Holy Ghost impetus, Holy Ghost plan, Holy Ghost purpose, Holy Ghost pursuit. And to get so refreshed in him that he will renew our youth like the eagles. People will think we got a facelift. <laughs> We're going to let him renew us inside and outside until we run with fire. I don't care if you're 80. I don't care if you're 60. I don't care if you're 40. I don't care if you're 20. And I don't care if you're two. The Holy Ghost is going to smack you through and through. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 These bones of the Northwest, I say by the Holy Ghost who directed me to preach and prophesy this message, this, these bones of the Northwest, Utah, Montana, Wyoming, Oregon, of course, Washington, Northern California, all the way down to the tip of California, these bones shall live again. And even as Azusa Street took place on the West Coast, even as some of the mightiest moves of God took place on the West Coast, the bones shall be shaken here with the glory of God until it is a move of God that goes throughout the entire world. And we are part of that mighty army that's going to be used to cause these bones to live. 
if we will yield and obey. 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 Let him go deep. Let him do spiritual surgery on you till you're not recognizable, until you're so pliable in his hands. I'm just yielded and obedient to the plan of God. doesn't matter. doesn't matter how comfortable I am. doesn't matter what my own thoughts are, what I'd like to do with my life. I'm just yielded and obey, and I get to be one of those that stand before him on that day and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You yielded your own plans, your own purposes to mine. If we don't, he'll find somebody, but don't have that Calvinist attitude. Well, God will do it. His will will get done. It's supposed to be done through you and I. What a privilege. What a privilege. We just answer. We just answer. So can these dead bones live again? Yes. But before theirs live, ours got to live. And ours have to be, ours have to be full of the Holy Ghost, not part way. All the way full of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Parabasha brakatarabeske. Proskein de le mechekle. Mason takrabo shambreke. Vandere sikre se basho Everything that is being rearranged right now is coming together by divine order and divine plan and purpose. Do you think it coincidental? that I asked you to even start this? Do you think it's a coincidence that I asked you to start a school? Do you think it's a coincidence that Pastor Mark Spitzbergen is willing to lay his plans down of running all over the world and his ranch and everything to put into a church of this size? Do you think it's a coincidence that I'm calling people from the north, the south, and the east, and the west to participate in these things? Do you think it's a coincidence that I got you here for this moment in time in history and you think back on what you have come out of and what you've been called out of and how every step along the way I led you here? Do you think it's a coincidence and you found yourself here in the middle of the word, in the middle of the will of God, in the middle of the plan of God, in the middle of the move of the Holy Ghost. It is not coincidence. I look to and fro throughout the land for a man or a woman whose heart is perfect towards me. They may not be doing everything perfect, but their heart is after me. Their heart is hungry. Their heart is thirsty. Their heart wants to know truth. Their heart wants to know how to yield to me. And I find that man. I find that woman. And I bring them from every corner, just as a general would bring the best in his elite forces in for a special operation for in this hour in this moment in history in time in the last of the last days I have called you to prophesy to the dead bones I have called you to rise up on your feet army of the living God I have called you and called you to be mobilized to march 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 not according to your own plans and the way you want to do it but to march and I have put in place generals I put in place colonels. I put in place captains. I put in place lieutenants. I put in place sergeants. I put in place privates. And do not argue about why am I not the sergeant? Why am I not the captain? If you will yield yourself to me, promotion comes. If you yield yourself to me, I will see what I can trust you with. If you yield yourself to me, oh, the unexplainable and unutterable and unimaginable things I've prepared for those who love me and those who are ready to, be, to serve me and to be used in my plan. But it's for those who will do it my way, not your way. And I have called you to not murmur and complain, to not say, how come I have to do all this and this one doesn't want to? Do you not realize I have called you in closely? For there were 12 disciples, but only three came in those close places with me. And there was only one who made it his plan and purpose to lay his head in my breast. It was his plan and purpose to love me every chance he got. It's those people who will see the great and unimaginable things and be used in the hour, not because they have some merit of their own, but because they see my merit, because they love me, because they worship me, because they know who I am, because they want to be close to me, because they have set their single purpose and they've set their mind and they've set their faculties and they've set their will and they've set their emotions. They've set everything on being obedient to me and loving me and my plans and my purposes. And it's unto those, for this may not look like a large crowd, but many are called and few choose. Many have the opportunity but end up choosing the broad path. 
because the more you come in close, the more I can trust you and use you, the more narrow the path will be. And do not disdain it. And do not say, even as you have heard this day, how come I have to do this? And how come I'm up here and not somewhere else? And how come this and that? But say, oh God, you see something in my heart that you can trust. And you've brought me here for such a time as this. And it's under those that I will show you a higher way, a deeper way. I will bring you in from glory to glory, from faith to faith, and you shall see the harvest come in, and you shall do the mighty exploits because you know your God, because you choose to know your God. So do not disdain these moments, but be a willing soldier that says, I will get everything I can get out of basic training. I'll get everything I can get out of every assignment you give me, O oh God, for Lord, I want to be that one that you can trust and you can use in this hour and watch what I will do through you, says the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 As Brother Jeff plays, the first thing I'm going to ask is, I believe I know pretty much everybody here today, but I don't like to give a call or I don't like to let a day go without this call, put it that way. If you're here and you say, I don't know if I've given my heart to Jesus. I know about him. I try to be a pretty good person. I might even believe he is the son of God, but I don't know that I've made him my Lord and my Savior, that I have ever asked him to come into my heart and forgive me of my sins and make me a brand new person in him. If you're here and you say, I don't know that I've done that, but I want to make sure I do that before I leave because there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. We want you to lift your hand and we want to pray with you this day and introduce you into the family of God in Jesus' name. All right, let me ask this. Who would say, according to the word of the Lord that's come forth today, I want to have more complete obedience, more complete surrender, and I will prophesy to my own dead bones first and then to those out there, come alive, Northwest, come alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to stand with me. Most of these services, or at least a great amount of them, we will lay hands on everything that moves. But this morning, I want you just to lift your hands toward heaven, where our help comes from together, and pray this, Father God, thank you for the privilege of being called according to your purpose and being alive in this hour to make a difference in a lost and dying world. And we prophesy to Washington, the Northwest, the United States, that these dead bones shall yet live, that we shall have a great awakening from coast to coast, and then we shall see revival all over the world, and that I will do whatever you ask me to do, I will go wherever you ask me to go I will say whatever you ask me to say I will yield to you use me don't leave me out of your plan Lord in Jesus name amen and amen so I say to your bones be set ablaze at every service this week go to a new level in him a new place, a new dimension in him. Press in for the realms you've never been in before. In Jesus' name, amen. Seven o'clock tonight, a Holy Ghost meeting. Amen.